Today is June 22nd, 2020. It's the day after Father's Day. The world isn't quite on fire like it used to be, which is nice. However, it's still not great because we apparently haven't figured out this corona nonsense yet, and my range that I shoot out, shoot at, just got shut down because somebody there tested positive for the Rona. Anyway, we're going to talk about that in a bit, and I brought my friend Steph back on because I needed somebody to talk to, and we're both going a little crazy during this <laughs> lockdown. You see the same four walls and the same people all the time, and you're like, let me out. So, Steph, for people who didn't listen to your first episode, refresh everybody on your background, who you is, what you do, and why they should care. Um, well, I was also going crazy with you, so I'm at a cabin right now. This is not my normal home. I don't live in a cabin because those are really hard to take care of. Um, but anyways, they are. You have to, like, redo the walls and stuff, like, every four years. It's super weird. But, um, so I'm a small arms repairman with the Minnesota National Guard full-time, so basically that just means that I go around the state and I work on weapons, um, and then I support my battalion on the weekends. So that's pretty much it. Right on. You also are a uh, Precision Rifle, National Rifle League. I get you're the PRS, NRL stuff mixed up because I don't yeah. care, but <laughs> it's very confusing to me. Um, but you also are a competitor in that. You shot, didn't you just do a traveling match down in like Tennessee or something? And it was like, and it rained on you for four days or some damn thing? Um, yeah, there was one in Nebraska. I'm trying to think of, I bring bad weather everywhere I go to shoot. So, like, it's always like, oh, okay, it's June, we're going to sleet, we're going to snow and, like, ice storm. Uh, but, no, so, yeah, I mainly stay with the NRL. The NRL is a National Rifle League, and it's still, like, pretty new. It started, like, two, three years ago. Kind of um, PRS, Precision Rifle Series, was the first, like, precision shooting organization, and now we have the National Rifle League. So, I go do that. I do two days. I do border wars matches um that's easier to do in the state of minnesota being in the north country it's just like a one day match and they hold a lot more around our area um i also write for a little uh website called gat daily hmm. also i'd like to mention and uh american gunsmith and um yeah so that's kind of been taken off lately but because social media is huge and writing is huge and journalism is huge these days Especially because one of the things that's been happening as a result of the corona teen, these corona times, is people are going nuts for content. They're like, I'll watch anything, I'll listen to anything, I'll read anything, and it, to me at least, it makes it more important for people who create content to be putting out good content in these corona times. Uh, I do need to pause for a second, and in case anybody's watching this, I am not a preacher, uh, I am wearing a black <laughs> t-shirt with a white ringer collar, oh uh, but I'm going to stand up. So it, this is my, this is my Calumet High School Wolverines t-shirt in honor of Red Dawn, which is the greatest movie of Ooh, all time. good one. Good yeah. choice. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. So, uh, but getting back to the online pub that we both write for, Gat Daily, you recently wrote an article about the Minnesota National Guard. And if you have been living in a cave uh, for like, what, three, could you imagine if you went to a coma in December of last year and you just came out of it yesterday? You'd be like, what in the fuck? Where so anyway. the cops go? <laughs> yeah, where'd all the cops go? Oh, you, well, imagine you went to a coma in Atlanta and you woke up and you're like, where, why's there no cops? What's going on? <laughs> but to that point, so you wrote an article about the Minnesota National Guard and their participation mm -hmm. in the, uh, hang on, civil unrest, which was Correct. recently- I changed that, yep. yep. Which was recently occurring yep. <laughs> in uh, the Minneapolis area. area. So- Talk to us, like, you know, obviously, we, I don't want you to blow OPSEC or anything like that, but talk to us, tell people what that was like. Like, what, how did that affect you as a small arms repairer? You know, what did you end up doing? Did they give you a, a busted ass old M16 and make you go stand in a line? Oh, that's a good thing to touch on. Um, so my reasoning. Oh, wait, hang on, before that. Uh, yep. nothing that we are about to say throughout this entire podcast is the opinion or um, has the endorsement uh, of yeah. the United States Army, the United States Air Force, or the Department of Defense. There we go. Yep, perfect. Now continue. Yeah. It's funny because, like, they don't really care, like, if you're talking good about an organization, but if you make, like, one little bad thing, they're like, oh, but you were representing your, like, the Army, and it's like, wait, what? 
<laughs> like you I'm, liked it before. I'm wearing a flannel shirt and my hair's all <laughs> yeah. fucked up. Like, no, I wasn't. Um, so when all this happened, and so this is a new concept for Minnesota in general, and I think everybody in general, we've, like I said, when the, before the Minnesota National Guard even started, we've never activated the whole National Guard. It's not just the Army, it's the Air Force, it's the Army, it's the entire state of Minnesota National Guard. And so we've never done anything like this. And so going into it, just as like a soldier, I had no idea what was going to happen. So I got the call around um, 9 a.m., and I was in Iowa about to shoot a match, and then I drove back. And um, we moved out from Ripley and it all happened in like three hours. Like we were supposed to show up at two, we got there, we got all our vehicles, we got all of our weapons and we moved down to uh, Minneapolis where we were stationed. So everybody was stationed in various different armories, like some at the convention center, everything like that. Um, and so the reason I wrote the article was because, like I said, I had no idea how this was gonna work. Nobody did. and. I support, in my battalion, I support a line unit. I am not the line unit. I am a company within the battalion that supports it. So basically our mission was to supply them. So all the guys that are running like patrol missions with LE, with various different uh, LE entities like sheriffs, um, state patrol, everything like that, we support them. We give them food, we give them water. And then we have bodies with us on the convoys just in case they need more bodies. So in this kind of aspect, every body counts, literally mm -hmm. every soldier counts. Um, and so it was really surreal to be down there in neighborhoods. I mean, I used to live in St. Paul. I was on the streets, like people were on the corner, soldiers were on the corners, people had big ass PLS, Humvees, LMTVs in neighborhoods. Like it was weird. And, um, but the big thing that I tried to put out in this article was that we are trying to do good. We are trying to support the cities. We are not trying to do anything like martial law or anything like that, like they're saying. Because mm -hmm. they see soldiers with guns, they think that different things are happening than what's actually happening. We are told to stay off the sidewalks. We are told to not basically just like change anybody's life with what was going on. We were just there just in case. Right. Um, and it's, so going back to the M16 thing, a big thing happened with FN and like the old M16A2s that were running, like the big picture that came around and everything like that. Um, in the National Guard, we don't run old S equipment like everybody thinks. It's just different companies that have... <laughs> what? I see like your eyes moving, like what? Talk to me. Uh, no, so what you're going to say, I, I'm assuming what you're going to say is some companies haven't gotten the new rifles yet and yeah. if you're a you know if you're not a line infantry company or a, a you know a combined arms battalion or mps the odds of you having the newest shit are pretty low when i was exactly. overseas uh last year and earlier this year i saw a lot of army support troops come through with you know m16 a2s and shit like that and i was like and for and you know mind you I'm in the Air Force and I've got like a brand spanking new FN made M4 with a new, you know, comp M4 on it. And I put a, you know, a nice SOP mod stock on it. So like my gun was relatively Perfect. Gucci for an issued rifle, right? Yeah. Uh, and and I what see, year was that? This was last year. Okay, perfect. Uh, so we saw, and so like, and when people are making fun of these National Guard kids, you know, who look like teenagers, first off, uh, because some of them are, with are. Their, <laughs> their, you know, ill-fitting riot gear and their M and their ancient M16s. I'm like, hey man, like, look, I get it. All right, these guys, they're not, they're not first in line for the equipment, and that's yep. one of the things that people don't understand is it's not like when the army says we need new M4s that you know FN can just snap their fingers and what half a million m4s are just going to appear overnight that's not how this works that's not how any of this works yep um no exactly and like especially your state funding matters too mm -hmm. so like in the state of minnesota we're funded very well i'm sure you've seen that too we have really good funding and so we have really good equipment yeah. what the fuck <laughs> uh so 
for people who don't know, I'm also, I, I'm in the reserves based out of the state of Minnesota, but because I'm a reservist, I'm federally funded. So we have, so our opposite number is the 133rd airlift wing. They're part of the Minnesota National Guard. And I was talking with some of the dudes over there and they have like all of this money to do all of this stuff and they have no bodies. And meanwhile, we've got like all of these people and we have no money for anything. Like this, the airplanes eat all of our money and we have no money for any sort of fun things. And Are I'm you saying like, they need to like up their numbers or are they just like what? They, so as far so they're, they're just super low manned uh in the yeah. 133rd is what i yeah. from what i understand they have they're they're constantly low manned so they're you know handing out enlistment bonuses like candy and things like really? that and i'm like i want to re-enlist i'm not gonna get i'm up for re-enlistment in october and i am definitely not getting a bonus this time and i'm like sad face why are they I, not they're are, not pushing them out no so it's i i don't i have no idea how bonuses work in the army and to be fair i don't actually know how they work in the air force because there's how the regs say they're supposed to work but that never seems to be how they actually work yeah uh so bonuses are based on like the percent that your career field is manned with also taking into account like the percent of manning that your base is and like it's all kinds of stuff that goes into it so cops haven't had a career field wide bonus like since i enlisted uh, and my base, we're not critically manned anymore, but we might be soon because a whole lot of people in my unit are thinking about getting out. Oh, I could see that. Okay. So then no, so it, it'll be like MOS specific, specific or like yeah. reclass bonuses or something like that. Okay. That makes sense. Yep. Pretty much. So back to, uh, yes. you guys fighting, you know, uh, <laughs> so I heard that the Minnesota national guard was going door to door and like, you know, shooting kids oh. in their sleep and stuff like that. And I, they were not. They weren't no. doing that internet. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, watch somebody edit just that, like mm -hmm. two, three seconds, like Caleb Giddings. Um, but no, so it was really cool because, so like I said, I didn't know how it was supposed to work. And when, when we got our brief, they were very specific on like, you don't do anything until law enforcement tells you. Like soldiers do not do anything until law enforcement tells you they're the boss. They take all instructions from the tower, the tower being law enforcement. And so even if you see somebody looting, even if you see somebody doing else, something else, you don't do anything until you're told um, because you're not your own law enforcement agency. Right. You fall under them. And so going back and getting feedback from law enforcement after all this ha stuff happened, they were happy. They loved it. They like needed the support of people and masses and it really helped calm everything down. I don't know if you saw the picture of the state Capitol with all those engineer vehicles, like on the steps, mm -hmm. like that stopped it. Like that right there was just like, all right, we're just going to end this right now. And it calmed everything down. Um, and so, no, that was the reason why I wrote the article is because people don't understand that because I didn't even understand that. And so to show how well it kind of worked and like how also like on Thursday when we first got the call they were like oh there's 500 National Guardsmen and like they're just standing there and they're not helping and it's like because we just got here there was even law enforcement agencies that got there that didn't know what to do because there wasn't a plan yet mm -hmm. you know like all these things have to me mesh together and it's all new and we're all learning and next time if this happens hopefully it doesn't it'll be faster to respond it'll be quicker and we won't have precincts burning down yeah, that was, uh, seeing that was, that was, that was quite shocking. Cause like, I know yeah. where that is, you know, and I was, th there were a couple of, there were a couple of nights being remote from it, but because again, I'm a member of a Minneapolis based unit, half of my, and you know, we're, uh, we're an MP squadron, which in the air force are called security forces in which our shorthand is just cops. We're a cop squadron, which means that most of our squadron are cops in Minneapolis. They're yeah. Bloomington PD, they're St. Paul PD. I don't actually think we have anybody who's Minneapolis PD in our squadron, which is odd, but you know, we've got, you know, everybody like literally almost our entire squadron is law enforcement or prior law enforcement or something like that. So I was hella worried. And of course, like, you know, all military bases, it's not in a great neighborhood either. So 
So did they, like, okay, so was anybody used then? Because I know you guys are reserved, so I don't think you guys were, like, used or anything, but do you know of any stories of, like, your people being used and how they were used? Or, no, like... we we went up, uh, we raised our FP con for the base, uh, and they put out a call for people, uh, for members of the unit to, who wanted to come up on orders. Cause basically what they, what they wanted to do is they wanted to secure double up on securing the installation. And sense. also they, because they pulled, uh, so the way the Minneapolis air reserve station is set up, it's on the back side of the airport. Right. And on one side, you've got the reserve side, which is us. And there's also a small contingent of Navy dorks there and like a Marine motor tea company or something. Um, and then over on the other side is the 133rd. So a bunch of the 133rd's guys got pulled. So we were having to cover their side of the installation as well. So they needed extra bodies basically to secure things. And they had some weird, some weird moments, but nothing, nothing bad happened up there, which is nice. Now, my friends were civilian Leos on the other hand, like uh, one of my, one of my best friends was suited up in riot gear right outside the mall of america just being like oh god they're gonna come burn down the damn mall (laughs) not the dsw he's like i don't want to she's like i don't want to get in a fight over this fucking mall are you kidding me and of course all of this on top of fucked up manning due to corona times like man shit is wild and shit continues to be wild down in like atlanta where the cops are like you know what i'm out i'm just i'm out fuck you people which yeah. that's a whole, uh, if you guys are, for people who are interested in getting a smart, well thought out take on law enforcement uses of force, qualified Im- immunity and stuff like that, I'm not the guy to listen to. However, what you should do is go on Facebook because you all have Facebook and go search for Bill Flowers. All right. Bill's a former cop. Uh, he worked in the Seattle metro area for years and years and years. And he's been posting some really great educational stuff about use of force, about qualified immunity. And he breaks it down in a way that makes it easier for a layperson, for someone who doesn't have experience doing any of this to understand. Because if there's one thing that I'm really fucking tired of it's people who have never had to carry a gun professionally, who have never even been in so much as a dust up on the street telling me about military and law enforcement uses of force. I'm like, you know what? Just shut the hell up. All right. Yeah. This is not your time to talk. Yeah. Um, I <sighs> want to touch on the magazine thing that was going around with National Guard soldiers. And oh, you mean not, not having, having mags in your weapons? Yeah. And so I don't know if what I'm about to say is going to be not Gucci or not, but I don't really care. Um, watch people just cut that right too. They're like, I don't give a fuck. So, so when the tag tag came out, the Adjutant General came out in like an interview when all this started, and he said, "Soldiers will use their weapons as needed, life, limb, or eyesight. They will prote- protect them. Soldiers will protect themselves." That's what he said. Okay. Right. At that point, there was never a standard put out by every like there like on the like the WhatsApp. Right. We all run off WhatsApp and group texts and stuff and. There was nothing that said, okay, soldiers are going to load their magazine. Soldiers are going to be in this status. It is up to that NCO, that leader, to say, all right, this is where I want us. Or he leaves it up to the soldier. Apparently, every freaking NCO was leaving it up to the soldier in, like, my company. And all the line units, they were good. Like, they had mags and they knew what was going on. I, like, was looking around me because every time I went into a vehicle to move out, like, go do a mission, I put a magazine in. And all my mags were loaded. Everything was fine. But I took it upon myself to do that, and I told my soldiers to do that because I wanted them to be in a combat mindset. You have to be. Right. You did not, it was bad out there. Like, it was bad. And so I did that for them. But that was because I took it upon myself to say that. And there were leaders that did not take it upon themselves and put their soldiers in bad situations because they didn't tell them to load their magazine. Because like you said, these are teenagers. They've never done anything like this, and they've never even thought of doing anything like this. And now they're on the streets of Minneapolis, the first people to respond without a fucking magazine, and they're gone. Yeah, I. Whenever I see that, I. That is a failure at unit level leadership. Like yeah. it's a failure at line level leadership, and it's not just a failure. And and what it is is a failure to train your soldiers or your airmen to the level that they should be at. You know, and I get it if you're like 
supply battalion motor T dude, you know, it would be like taking uh, an airman out of the comm section communications and me as a cop who my job is to teach people how to shoot. I would be like, you know what, just maybe like, can we not give this person a gun? Cause I would yeah. rather someone not have a gun at all if they're not comfortable loading it because now that gun's a liability. Yeah. Because if you take, you know, this, supply dork or you know whatever and you put them out there and they're not well trained or confident using their weapon well that weapon's now a liability because it can get taken yeah. away from them by somebody who's really comfortable Heck using yeah. it and yeah. i would rather just be like and i understand again you need the bodies and there's a lot of moving parts to a situation like this and it's also not something that is it's not Dealing with with civil disturbances while it's part of the mission of the National Guard is also not something they train for on the reg. Like maybe MP battalions do and stuff like that, but like you, how much time had you ever spent training for a civil disturbance before this? Uh, zero. People zero. Were learning like there, right? You know, like they with riot shields and stuff. They were just learning. Yeah, like it's zero. it's it's very much one of those things where like you have units that are prepared for it. You have units that train for this sort of thing. But getting those units into play can be difficult at times. And sometimes you just got to roll with what you got. So I was never mad at the no magazine thing. I understand that it's like maybe some leaders aren't comfortable with it. Maybe others are, you know, if, because if it, like, perfect example, like you said, your soldiers were all prepared. They were all relatively yeah. well trained. Like if it was me and a bunch of guys from my combat arms section, of course, we're going to have mags or guns. We're all not. Oh, changing subjects away from the end of the freaking world, which yeah. uh, it appears to be going on. Um, we had a, well, actually, this is still sort of the end of the world. How are you guys doing with the Rona up there? Like, are your ranges open in Minnesota? Uh, so Minnesota, like I was saying before, because we were talking about drinking um, together, but <laughs> Minnesota is at like 50%. Like, we're, we're doing our stages, right? All the states are opening mm -hmm. up as stages. And so all of our bars and stuff are opening, but they're at like 50% capacity. Um, our numbers are going down, but everyone has their issues with what those numbers actually mean. So I don't know. I'm chilling. I'm not. <laughs> yeah. I went out. I went out yesterday because it was Father's Day and it was an outdoor restaurant and like it wasn't, I didn't feel weird about it. All the staff were wearing masks. So I'm like, this is fine. I'm not too worried yeah. about this. Yeah. Um, we have, so we're doing phased, so most of Florida is just like, send it and open all the shit up. Uh, Haven't they been like that this whole time though? Some parts have. Okay. So, like some parts of Florida have. Uh, in Miami Dade, they because we're the epicenter down here in uh, Miami, they've been doing like phased reopening. And uh, we had, so I got a phone call yesterday. Every Tuesday, I go to Homestead Training Center and I train, I shoot videos, I do the things that I need to do for my job. Uh, I get a phone call yesterday from the range. They're being like, hey, we're canceling your reservation for Tuesday because we have to close for a week. Sorry, bye. Hangs up. I was like, tight. Uh, later that night, they posted on their social that the reason they were closing for a week is one of their staff members tested positive for the Rona. They didn't tell you that on the phone? No. I didn't ask. Saying? I was like, I, it was one of those things where you could, I, that was my suspicion. Yeah. Like the whole time I'm like, they sound really concerned right now. I'm not going to fuck with this guy. I feel like he's having a bad enough day without me being a dick to him. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> You have uh, to make a reservation then, like for a bay or something? Or yeah, what? so with the range that I train at, they're, they've got like open like open bays, right? That you can, yeah. So they've got your regular, like they've got a 25-yard pistol bay and they've got a 100-yard rifle bay. And, you know, you can just show up and shoot well when they're open you can just show up and pay your okay. lane fee and go shoot on those. Uh, I don't like to be around other people when I'm shooting because gun owners are the worst and I don't want to get shot in the Let's, kidneys. Somebody's going to edit that now too, Caleb. I'll, I'll, edit that, I'll edit that <laughs> clip out and play it on repeat. The number of times I have almost been shot on public gun ranges because people don't know what the 
fuck they're doing with handguns, especially handguns. My all-time favorite, and for people who are listening, I'm gonna like if you're listening to the audio version of this, this isn't gonna this part. You just skip ahead like 30 seconds. But my all-time favorite is the guy who takes this malfunctioning pistol and turns it like turns it sideways so it's pointed straight at the person next to him to try to clear the malfunction. Because that guy's me sometimes. And I don't really <laughs> want to get shot laterally. Like, can you imagine getting laterally transfixed with a bullet it goes through, hits both your kidneys and like your spleen and shit? Fuck that. So anyway, I don't Especially like- from like Joe Schmo who has a beer gut who shouldn't even be at the range. I'd be pissed about that. Like I want to <laughs> I'd be so mad. If I got shot by some asshole on accident, I'd be so pissed. Uh, but yeah, so when I shoot I reserve a private bay and I do that too. So I can like draw from the holster so I can work on movement. So I can do all of the things that I need to do to train without being messed with by, you know, either FUD ROs or like, Oh, you can videotape it too. Like you can put your camera on, not worry. Yeah. It makes things a lot easier. So tomorrow, so because they closed the bay, I had to go to my backup option, which is a two hour drive, which sucks. So, yeah, that's tomorrow's, tomorrow's yeah. gonna be a fun day. We're yeah. all open, like they say, like no visitors and everything, but no, we're all pretty open. And I have to think that, like, when when things like that happen, when coronavirus happens at ranges, you know that they didn't get it from that range. But it's good that they're taking the steps to mm-hmm. clean everything because now that person used the bathroom. Our our unit medic is so we have two kinds of medics in the Air Force. So we have like actual medic medics right? So we've got guys who are, you know, they're, that's their, M- their MOS is to be a medic. Uh, and there's like 50 different flavors of them and they're all girls and they're all dime pieces. Um, and then in- Flavors? <laughs> oh, oh, oh my God. Hang on. So <laughs> we had, so all right, uh, last year uh, I was overseas and I was running a shoot house. So we're doing a, a, a shoot, move and communicate with live ammo in a shoot house, you know, safe, safe environment. We were, it was, it was all done very safely. We have to bring per air force regs. We have to bring two actual medics in an ambulance with us in case there's an injury. Right. So we get all done for the day and we're like, and one of my other instructors was like, Hey, do you want to let the medics take a run at it? And I'm like, sure. One at a time, no other bodies in the house, but what were you shooting? What were you doing? Uh, uh, shoot, move and communicate through, uh, uh, oh, in a house? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, with live ammo. So at Ripley? No, this was overseas. This was oh, at okay. a yeah. This was at a range. Yeah, Ripley. They don't okay. let you do that. It's they're like Sims only. All Sims. Yeah. Which is safer because when somebody comes out and points a Sim gun at me, my butthole doesn't slam shut. All right. I had it. I. I <laughs> oh, the best part is, the day we were running this house host nation dudes were like two ranges down shooting a 50 cal and they cracked around over the berm that went over our shoot house and my instructor who was up on the catwalk of our shoot house heard it go by and he was like and i was like hey do you want to come down from there and he goes honestly either i'm not going to get hit and it's not going to be a problem or i'm going to get hit and it's not going to be my problem yeah, because so, like, because he'll be exploded. Yeah, because you're you'll be dead. <laughs> Just <laughs> okay. Anyway, fifty cal doesn't give a fuck about your body armor, right? Uh, so anyway, so we get these medics, and first off, again, these medics are like, like imagine the stereotype of every girl in the Air Force. They're hot. They're wearing full makeup in the middle of the fucking desert, mind you. Uh, they're they didn't they don't have any ppe of their own so they've got to borrow somebody else's which means it fits like shit and they just look like a hot bag of ass walking through this shoot house and i just want to say so we had the way i had the house set up was we had uh we had targets that were like up on target backers and then we had a green ernie you know those plastic pop-up targets we had one of those that was nailed to a four by four and had a t-shirt on him green ernie was the green ernie with the t-shirt was a no shoot right like he was the hostage don't shoot him all right the Mm -hmm. only freaking person that shot him was the medic she (laughs) walked right into that door saw a target and i I have to give her credit she shot him right in the middle of the high center chest like she killed the fuck out of him and we got done and i was like so remember when i said there was one guy that you weren't gonna shoot 
and he looked different than all the other guys you were supposed to shoot? She's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. shot him right in the chest. Good job. <laughs> like, he's dead as hell. Uh, which is why I don't think that everybody in the Air Force needs to carry a gun. Got but it. moving on from this topic, let's talk about competition shooting because okay. it's starting to come back, thank God. Yeah. Like, we're starting to have matches again, which is nice. I have a match at the end of July that I'm going to. Uh, we've had some club matches. So for people who don't know what, like, PRS and NRL are, kind of explain what these, you know, rifle-only sports are all about. So whenever I refer to precision rifle, I say just precision rifle. I shoot precision rifle because that can mean I'm going to a club match or a national match or anything like that. It just means I'm using my bolt gun or whatever, what have you. Just I'm using my precision rifle. And um, so a club match, um, so God, usually I have it to like whip it out, but I'm using a Magpul Pro 700 chassis. I'm shooting 6.5 Creed on it. Um, but uh, where was I going with that? Okay, so like if you were going to shoot precision rifle, you would do either a club match, and a club match is like your local range holds a precision rifle mm -hmm. match, and often they don't, they're, it's really hard to find club matches, like in certain states, just because they don't do it. They don't have the land for it, whatever. Right. It's hard to get out to, you know, 500, 700 yards on some ranges. Exactly, and for, with precision rifle, you're going to be shooting out to 1,200, like in a standard match. Like, that, it, it, it gets you out there. Um, and so then we have our, our national organizations, which is PRS, Precision, Precision Rifle Series, and then we have NRL, National Rifle League. And so, like, I always say as a beginner um, to go to NRL Border Wars because they have still, like, competitive dudes, but it's a one-day match. It's kind of less stress, and then you'll have time to learn. I do not recommend going to a Precision Rifle Series without going onto the, like, Facebook pages and linking up with a mentor um, every match I go to, I still go with a mentor because I don't want to learn the wrong way at first. Mm -hmm. And so that's like a huge thing, especially with precision rifle is like, you can screw it up really easily. Um, and then I also would say I, I'm a big proponent of 6.5 Creed still because I'm still starting off. I can get the ammo really easily and it's it, pretty good with wind. Um, so Wait, is there a newer, fun. cooler caliber than 6.5 Creed more? Uh, there's a million newer and cooler calibers than 6.5 Creed. <sighs> Back in my day, all we had was 7.6 <laughs> NATO and we liked it. We had to walk uphill to school both ways in the snow. Uh, I mean, people are still doing like minutes instead of mills and stuff and like more power to them that's great but it's like 308 these days i would i want to get really really good at precision rifle and then i'll go back and shoot tactical with mm -hmm. 308 because that's badass like if you get really good at 308 because it's a shitty round like it is, it yeah. is. okay so uh we're gonna make some more people mad uh okay. 308 sucks Super All duper right. sucks. It's super duper sucks. It's not a great intermediate range rifle cartridge. It's a terrible assault rifle cartridge. So for like short range stuff inside of 500 meters, you're better off with a 5.56. Five, and if you want to reach out and touch stuff, like literally everything is better. 338 Lapua is better. 6.5 Creedmoor is better. You know, so listen up, FUDs. 308 sucks. Uh, well, isn't and I'm probably gonna get the history wrong, but weren't we supposed to have six five Swedes starting off and then there was a reason that the army didn't adopt it or something and then we adopted oh, real eight? Yeah. I just did an article about this. We were all supposed to do so NATO we were all going to do, it was like a 260 round that okay. the British had designed for the original, for their shitty bullpup rifle. Uh, so it was like a 260 round that they had designed for that. And then because the army loves, so as well you know, it's really hard to get the army ordinance people to change their minds about stuff, right? Like yeah. super duper difficult. And because they were so you know, I, I'm, I'm fairly convinced that if they had their way, we'd still be using bolt action 30 on 60s. <laughs> um, Fair. And that was what they wanted, was they yeah. wanted a 30 out 6 because, God damn it, that beat the Nazis, and it did God great in it. Korea, so I want a 30 cal round, and that was what the 7.62 NATO was designed. It was designed to give you the same terminal ballistics as 30 out 6 but in a slightly more compact package. 
and then we forced it on the rest of the world because we're kind of dicks. And the best part about the 308 story is we forced it on like the rest of NATO. We're like, this is the new NATO standard cartridge. We're all going to use it because NATO and allies and da 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 da. And then like five years later, when we were in Vietnam, we're like, uh, five, five, six. And, yeah. and the rest of NATO was like, hey man, fuck you. Like we all Who'd you write this one for? This is this is a part of a, a an ongoing project that I'm oh, working okay. on with uh, Lucky Gunner actually, which I have no idea where it's at right now. So it's not posted yet. No, it's not published okay. yet. But okay, yeah. So originally we were supposed to have like a 260 round, and we ended up not getting it because of the army. And what's funny is we're eventually like if things continue on the track that they seem to be going, the next military rifle round is going to be like a 260. It's going to be like a yeah. six five something. People run that in PRS in precision rifle too. Oh yeah, for 260. sure. Two sixty. Yeah. Yeah. There's like yeah. There's some really. There's some. I will say. There's some interesting stuff in PRS. I have never personally shot a match. Uh, it's one of the. I went to. I went to a class in at the JP Rifles facility down oh, in cool. Nevada, uh, where. I think it was in Nevada. No, New Mexico. Sorry. Went down to New Mexico. We took a class down there with uh, a bunch of their guys. And I remember the first day of class, you know, there's all these people there, like, you know, gun writers, a couple of PRS dudes. The instructors are former special operations sniper school grad dudes. So, like, they know what the – everybody there except yeah. for me <laughs> knows what's up, right? That's intimidating. Like, oh, well, one of, the, one of the gun writers that was there was Candace Horner who is oh, okay, a yep. female PRS fucking champion, right? Yeah. So, and I'm like the handgun guy. I don't even know why I'm here, but here I am. And so day one of class, they go, all right, guys, so today we're going to start with some short range stuff out to about 300 meters. My hand shot up. And I was like, uh, I'm sorry, you said short range in 300 meters in yeah. the same sentence. And that's uh -huh. not. Yeah. But... It was fun. I learned a lot and I've never gone to a PRS match just, and it's not that I don't, I, I actually think that PRS is cool. I think PRS is cooler than three gun. Um, yeah. and you see a lot of three gun refugees have landed in PRS. Uh, <laughs> but what? Refugees. That's yes. Like okay. Hold on. State of the shooting <laughs> sports. Three gun yes. is on the duck line. Like three guns been going down. In yeah for a while and a big part of that is the end of three gun nation when yep. all the sponsor money got pulled out of that and refugees from three gun because that's the best term for them have kind of landed in one of two places they've either ended up over in prs shooting over there or they've gone over to uspsa to shoot pistol caliber carbines because yeah lord knows i want to shoot a rifle at a pistol match anyway well with three gun they've actually they're starting to get out of the distance too with mm -hmm. their rifle which is pretty cool but i mean if anything i the whole sport's gonna start changing i, I just think it's gonna get longer yeah people like the to distance. shoot i mean people like to shoot long range which is cool yep. you know i don't personally but yeah. a lots of like prs has been super popular and it's been a big hit so if you're a new shooter now can you explain a little bit the difference between prs the organizational body and nrl the organizational body uh was there was I'm this people mad at me <laughs> yay it's okay because we're gonna do a we piss off the internet segment a bit later perfect <laughs> um nrl was started because and this is me just saying it because some people didn't like how prs was running their organization um I personally like the people better in NRL. I think it's more fair. I think it's more honest. And I think they're very good to their match directors and let them kind of run the show. Um, NRL, especially too, with all this COVID stuff, they've created their, um, God, I sound like a spokesperson. That's terrible. But I just feel good. I feel passionate about good things, good organizations. But they're, with the COVID thing, they actually extended their, so say you bought like a, um, uh, membership for the year to, mm -hmm. to have your points count, right? You have to have a membership to have your points count in IRL and PRS. Say you bought a membership for 2020, it is now moved into 2021. So like all the matches in 2021 are going to count now 
for that last um, hmm. year because we couldn't shoot any matches. Which Interestingly, is nice. uh, IDPA, the one of the two action pistol sports, did the same thing where they're like, "Hey, we're canceling our nationals for 2020 because of." And this was actually something I really agreed with. They pointed out that it was less a concern about the disease because nationals were scheduled for September and they canceled it in May. And they said, you know, one, we're concerned about the disease, yes, but we are concerned about the economic impact because as you know, there are very few people in our sports who get paid to do it, you know? Yep. And uh, our, everything is volunteer. Can you explain that really quick? Because people don't understand that. Yeah. There are very few people in our sport that get paid to do it. Like almost no one. So in the pistol shooting sports, at your very, very top tier, you have guys who are paid by organizations to represent them. And like you can literally name Max Michelle, JJ Vercaza, uh, um, the Team Glock guys, you know. So there's like 10 maybe that are – paid professional athletes to do it now there's trickle down for that too because then you get into guys who are instructors who shoot the sports to help keep their skills sharp to help promote their teaching you've got guys like me who are media members who get paid to cover the classes stuff like that or cover the matches and stuff like that so there is a trickle down of people who get paid but even then if you take everybody who gets monetary compensation from the shooting sports it's still, you know, 1% of the participants, yeah. if that. Our sport is so, so deeply volunteer-based. It is, without volunteers, we have no matches. Like, that's, we have nothing. And, you know, it's just a bunch of weirdos standing around on the range. And what IDPA said was that they're like, because our sport is driven by, by volunteers, volunteers who may have lost their jobs, who may have had, had to make tough financial choices. We don't believe it would be ethical to ask people to, you know, give up two weeks out of their life to go volunteer to run this match in yeah. September. And I agreed with that. You know, it sucked for me because I was looking forward to shooting it. But what they then did was they then extended everybody's memberships for a year. And also to get into nationals and IDPA, you have to have enough points and you get points by shooting like uh club or not club matches you get points by shooting like state and regionals and stuff like that so all of the points that i accumulate all of this year and all of next year will count for next year's nationals yeah. so i thought that was a pretty cool guy move the flip side is uh uspsa is just doing their nationals they just had pcc nationals last weekend and i'm like whatever I, yeah you know i <laughs> i think i think every uh, in these strange corona times, every organization is going to make the choice that best fits their risk assessment yep. and their membership. And if you, here's the best part, guys. If you don't agree with an organization's choice, you don't have to participate. So don't at me about how IDPA is terrible for canceling their match and don't at me for how USPSA is terrible for having their matches because if you disagree, you don't have to participate. And is that what happens? People oh, yeah. at you about that? That's some, what do you have to fucking do with it? Yeah. <laughs> well, they're like, I can't believe you're supporting. It's usually like somebody will be like, I can't believe you're supporting this, or I can't believe you're not supporting this. And I'm like, hey, man, you know, I got a job to do here, all right? Yeah. My job is to make content and have opinions about stuff. And if you don't like it, that's fine. However, you know, I'm not in, like, I'm not talking to the president of USPSA. I'm not talking to the president of IDPA. And they also don't give a shit what I think because they shouldn't. They should yeah. make the choice that's best for their uh, organization. Just like NRL and, you know, PRS have done during yeah. this COVID time where NRL, NRL canceled most of their matches during oh. the quarantine, right? Yeah, they did. Yeah, because they left out their to their match directors too, and then they realized like there are people that can't come across state lines, so they're not going to do it. And they did matches to where they had like two person like squads, mm -hmm. like not ten person. So they had to change out the whole layout, and it was like it worked out fantastically. But they made changes, and that's up to them. And I I think great to them. I just think we need to be open and honest about it because there's a lot of organizations that said they were following rules and they weren't. So as long as you're open and honest about what you're doing, get on with yourself. Like it's, it's all good. But, um, I do want to say though, I don't think it's bad that you're not shooting like PRS or anything. Like I think everyone has their thing and in mm -hmm. order for you to be good at a thing, you have to focus on that thing. Like, yeah, there's, 
it's it's one of those things where my she like and this is this is something that can apply to everyone so let's say you carry a gun for personal protection right i think that you should have a certain level of handgun skills if you're going to choose to carry a, a handgun for personal protection me as a military member i also think i should have a certain level of rifle skills because i have to carry a rifle for work right so once i hit that everything else i do with a handgun is for my own personal enjoyment or my career advancement or however i want to do it and it's the same thing with something like prs like if you're a cop and you carry a gun you know i think you should be you know have this level of skill with your gun but if you like to shoot prs fucking go shoot prs man yeah. you shouldn't feel the need to go shoot uspsa matches because of what you do go do what you like and to steal a phrase from Steve Fisher, it's all sights and triggers anyways. Yeah. Yeah, Which, you can, it all moves over. Yeah. It really I, does. Especially, and I will say this, handgun absolutely moves up to rifle. Like if you're good at shooting a handgun, it makes shooting a rifle easier because the rifle's an inherently easier platform to shoot, right? It's more stable, it's heavier, usually it's got better sights and all of that stuff. And I found the hardest part for me when I did that PRS class wasn't the shooting. It was all the fucking math. Yes. I was yep. like, wait, wait, hang on. I, this, and I read this thing and I got a dial and like mills and. They I'm probably just, made it super detailed though. Like at that class, like now we all have ballistic calculators and stuff. Right. So they probably, and you can deep dive into that, but you were probably in like a hard way to learn it, you know, because you weren't just inputting stuff. Well, and also I'm retarded. Fuck. Oh. Said it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord. That's all right. okay. Bleep. So now, yeah, right. We're gonna bleep that one again. All right. So now we're going to piss off the internet. So. Okay. How, how this is going to work. I'm going to make a controversial statement. We're going to talk about it. Then you're going to make another controversial statement. And I don't know what your controversial statement is. So take a minute to think about that while I make my controversial statement. Hi. Welcome to Caleb. And that's fun. You can think of something. <laughs> Welcome to okay. Caleb and Steph piss off the internet. Today, Caleb would like to remind you guys that simply surviving a lethal force encounter, whether as a civilian, member of law enforcement, or a member of the military, does not make you an expert on using deadly force. Can you repeat that? Yep. Surviving <laughs> a... <clears throat> so, surviving a deadly force encounter, whether as a civilian, a member of law enforcement, or a member of the military, does not automatically make you an expert on using deadly force oh i see what's happening right now like, and where this is coming from okay yes no i actually uh, okay as an Not example there's a lot of like 65-year-old grannies who have smoked home invaders, those are also probably not the people that you need to be getting your tactical uh, firearms advice from. So you're not referring to a certain person or anything right now? I'm actually not. Oh, okay. But if okay. somebody wants to think that I'm referring to a certain... That's why th these piss off the internet, because I say <laughs> these things, and yeah. somebody out there who's listening to this is like, oh, I fucking hate Caleb. He's talking about this guy, and I really yeah. like that guy. And I'm like, I wasn't, because I don't know that guy exists a lot of the time but, if but they so they, it's one incident though like that's right. the thing too is like you survived one incident whether whatever was happening was happening how does that make you a expert on other incidents that are going to happen with that like yeah no f no i i know my lane and that like that's not my lane, even if I survive some dude trying to fucking shoot me in my car and rape me or some, whatever have you. Wow, like, that went, you got not. dark really fast. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, honestly. And so, yeah, just because I survived it doesn't mean I would be like, well, shoot, maybe I've done that, and then it'd be the end of it. You know, like, I would have no idea how to handle that again the next time unless I learned from somebody else. Well, and that's kind of the point of this segment is you can survive, you can even prevail in a use of force encounter in a violent encounter without mm -hmm. necessarily having a pre-existing expertise and yeah. what you have become by doing that is you become an expert in your use of force encounter and i would never presume to tell someone who had had a deadly force or a use of force how they did their thing because yeah. they obviously you know made it out sometimes people survive these things by dumb luck though like let's be honest like you sometimes you, you, you made it through through dumb luck and that's okay too my problem is when you have situations where someone has been 
you know, whether it's, you know, they were in like, I'm going to use a very broad brush example. So let's say somebody was in the military and I'll use this cause it's relatable. They were in like some exchanges of machine gun fire at 500 meters when they were in, which is legit. Sounds yeah. terrible. Do not wish to create joinder with those people. You know, you got your CIB, whatever, or your, whatever the Marines <laughs> call it. Good job, dude. That's awesome. That does not automatically make you an expert on civilian concealed carry. That does not automatically make you an expert on law enforcement tactics. Okay. And that's what this really is, is fucking stay in your lane, people, exactly. and be able to recognize your lane. I am not going to tell you how to fix a, a fucking machine gun because you know machine guns way better than I do. You work with them all the time. I work with machine guns three times a year. Mm -hmm. And this year it'll probably be once. So it's, so that's, that's my Caleb upsets people is stay in your lane and be self aware enough to understand yes. where your lane is because that's really tough. And um, yeah. that can be tough even for people like me where I'm like, I have opinions and all of a sudden I'm talking about something and I'm like, you know what? Uh, that might not have been the most informed opinion I've ever given. So maybe don't listen to me right now. Well, it's all like social skills too. I mean, it really comes down to social skills. Like maybe Caleb shouldn't fucking put his opinion everywhere when he shouldn't be. Cause that's a, so that's just like a social, like read the room, Caleb. Like, you know, it's just, it's kind of that. Like, yeah, I don't go up to a range like with people I'm supporting and try to teach them how to shoot their guns because they've shot their guns way more than I have. I've worked on their guns, you know, like I know things, but read the room. If there's a person who I know is not going to know how to shoot a weapon, I might give them some helpful hints. If I go up to some dude who I know has been in that lane and t does that lane, teaches that lane, whatever, and I shouldn't say just been in it because we're going back to just experiences don't help you out. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not going to teach. I'm going to read the room and be like, all right, I'm just going to sit here and learn. You know, like, it's it's people who can't just shut up. I and, forget. yeah. I, I forget who said this to me, but it's something that has stuck with me is that expertise is the combination of training and experience. Yeah. You know, it's a so that's like, a good way to look at you it. You can have all of the training in the world and be very technically knowledgeable, but lack, you know, maybe some of the real world application. Uh, and you can have had some of the real world application and not necessarily had good training leading up to that or after that. And without both of those kind of coming together, it's hard to get that like true mesh of expertise. And there are lots of people out there who are really great experts. Uh, like if you want to know more about, I mean, honestly, if you want to know more about stuff, there's actual like really smart dudes out there who talk about it and train and, you know, teach classes. And I think if there's one thing that I would like people to think about is, let's say you're taking like some training courses. If the instructor that you're training from doesn't also go take courses himself or herself, maybe find a different one because I want my instructors to be students as well. I want them to be constantly learning. Yeah. And like, that's the thing too, is when you're looking for instructors, like don't just focus off their bios. Like mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about Steve Fisher again. Cause we just love to fuck talk about him. His bios are he, not out he, there like a long shot. They're he not. also loves to be talked about. So that's fair. And he acts like he doesn't, but he oh, does. He loves it. Um, his bio isn't out there. Like he doesn't like, if, I mean, even if you look at his Instagram or Facebook, whatever, he doesn't promote himself like other people do. No. He promotes himself by the people that know him, love him, learn from him, everything like that. That's where you find those good people. Um, the moment that somebody says, I've been in the military for 27 years and thinks that that's enough to, like, get some students in, that's the moment you kind of want to be like, all right, well, let's think about what's going on here and who this person is. You Some know? of my favorite instructors uh, are our former military guys who have gotten out and they've been like, hey, look, I have all of this really cool, like tip of the spear special operations experience. I've also been to this guy's class and this guy's class. You know, I'm a master class competition shooter now. Like I'm like, because there are dudes out there who are like the, who not only were like the real deal operationally, but are also like really good shooters and, you know, all yeah. of this stuff. So again, there's a lot of options out there, guys. So choose your instructors carefully. And I don't know how we got on that topic, but now I, I want to say, yes. yes, before we move on really quick, um, you talked about having experience and technical knowledge and everything like that pushed together. Um, in the last 
podcast, you asked me if there was one change I could make with National Guard. Like, oh yeah, I did. Thing. Okay, I want to change my answer. Oh, okay. As I was thinking about it in the bathroom. Um, I want to have small arms repairers, and we have this. So we have like these people call MSTs, and basically like they're mechanics or whatever, and they embed themselves with line units, and they stay with the line units in case their vehicles go down. They can just work on them really quick, whatever. I want, and there's battalions and companies that actually, they are just made of these people, these small arms repairmen that are embedded with line units, but I want like a section of small arms repair units cut in half, have half year, half year, whatever, like quarter it, go to these line units and live with them, sleep with them, not sleep with them, not. Not but. like that, get your mind, you're the one who's doing it now. <laughs> First, like, yeah, I said two words, we got to bleep, but you're like, ah, I peed off the side of a boat, and we're sleeping with line companies. I'm like, oh, God. Oh, God. We're transparent, Caleb. That's why I love you, too. Like, we're just, <laughs> our, we're, but um, when a small arms repair, I've learned, like, most of what I know from being on the, on the line with the guys and watching these weapons run. That's how I've learned how to help them. If a small arms repairman comes up to me and says, I'm better than you, or I know this because I've worked in the vault for 10 years and they, I never see their asses on the line with the guys, I am instantly going to lose respect for them because they aren't with, they aren't watching the guns run. They aren't learning what these people need, like what lubricants they need, like how they just need help. These line units need help. And if there's one thing I could say, it's like, get force these people to get on the range and help these guys because that's what you should be doing as a small arms repairman. Not staying in the vault. You should be out there with soldiers and just fucking get your ass out there. I'm sick of these people trying to tell me they know what's what and like never been with the people they support. Like, come on. That's, I will say that's one thing that I do like about the way we do it at the Air Force is not only do we do all of the maintenance, but we also run all the lines. Perfect. So, <clears throat> so like when we're doing our annual qual, like, you know, uh, in a couple of months, I'll be up there. And we're going to do our machine gun qual. I will be, not only will I be supervising the qual, but before we, the, the line guys get out there to do it, I have to qual myself. So another instructor will be running the gun pit and I'll be doing, and I'll actually be shooting the exact same qual that all of the other troopers are going to shoot so that. that I know what's up. I know how the guns are going to run. I know which 240 I want to hit with an ax and throw off the side of a bridge, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, what in the hell was that? Are you okay? Yeah. Is I your world heard, on like, fire over there? No, I just heard like a horn. I heard it too. I don't think it's on my side. No, it was like, definitely here. I think like, hang on, let me make sure the heavens haven't opened and so there aren't like angels coming down. <laughs> what the fuck was that? Anyway, well, the building's not on fire that I'm aware of, but it might okay. be. Hey guys, if this podcast has to end suddenly, it's because the building's on fire. Anyway, <laughs> um, but to that point uh, as well, that reminds me, once we get this Corona stuff settled down, I really want to get in touch with your leadership and my leadership and we can do like an inf and we can do like uh uh yeah uh, swapsies Cross, like yeah. i would love for you to come over for a drill weekend and see how we do things differently and for you know us to send people over to you guys to see how you do things differently than us i think that would be great i'd love that yeah i think it'd be cool uh but all right so now i need you to say something controversial to upset the internet stuff so give me something good um Okay, your and this is kind of a topic I want to talk about anyways. Um, your black felt slings that you used 30, 40 years ago aren't good enough anymore. That's my controversial topic, and it's not super duper con The black felt, just like two-point slings that are on everyone's weapons in the Army still. Do you not oh. know what I'm talking about? Just like the shitty black slings. No, we have uh, our standard issue sling is a blue force gear. Okay, hey, yeah, well, that's fucking great, isn't it? <laughs> Caleb, I don't know what worlds you're living in, but I don't live in it. So, okay, so that's not happening around the world. That's not happening in the Army. That's not happening in the National Guard. Um, I under... <laughs> yeah, no, we, like, all of our... This is, this is how jacked up the Air Force is. So our standard issue sling is that really good two-point blue force gear adjustable Perfect. sling, right? Adjustable. Okay. Yep. Yeah, of course. 
Yeah, the problem okay, is- Okay, see, you say that. You say that. You're like looking at me like I'm a crazy person. Like, what are you talking about? Now, here's the best part <laughs> is nobody fucking knows how to use it. Like they just give yeah. these rifles to these kids with the sling on it and no one teaches them how to adjust it or anything like that. So they're always saying, oh, this sling sucks. It's shitty. I'm like, no, dude, this is actually one of the better commercial slings on the market. Yeah. You just don't know what you're doing with it. And, you know, so I show people how to adjust their slings a lot. Perfect. But That's what wait you a minute. Do. So you guys have like like the old like Vietnam, like just big nylon bullcrap slings? Yes. And so that is one of the things I always find things I want to change and I like put my whole like ass into it to change it. And that's my thing right now. <clears throat> so <laughs> So you don't have a big enough ass to affect that yes, kind of change. I do, Kayla. God damn it. Just because I'm white. Okay, you can cut that out too. <laughs> but um that yeah, so I saw that as an issue when we did state active duty. Um that there one, there wasn't enough slings for everybody. I so I brought my own PMAGs and I brought my own sling because I'm in charge of my own life. Now, I don't trust those magazines, and I don't trust those slings. I don't like them because I want my adjustable. And so with the adjustable, you can do everything that you wanted to do with the black felt slings, but easier. Wait, wait, wait. You brought your own mags? Fuck yeah, I did. I brought, because. <laughs> wait a minute, you guys don't, so you guys don't get issued P mags? Uh, no, P mags, so P mags for the Army. Okay, listen up, soldiers, if you want to get your unit high speed. P mags for the Army are AAL now. AL means additional authorized list. It means you don't get them in the COEI. You don't get them issued. It means you have to order them separately. Um, and so with M855A1, the new round, it is shaped differently and it has a harder tip. So if you don't get a magazine like the EPM or the Enhanced Performance Magazine or the PMAG, you're going to have bad fucking time and you're going to have a lot of malfunctions. Mm -hmm. So I brought my own PMAGs because I know that the magazines that I'm going to be issued are green followers steel. Steel magazines with green followers, steel bodies. Wait, you guys don't even have the tan follower mags? Jesus. No, Caleb, I don't know what world you're in. That's what I'm saying. Like, Okay, so in the Air Force, we're getting <laughs> rid of all of our tan follower mags yes. and replacing them with P-Mags, like force-wide. Yeah, Love that. It's great. Yeah, we've got the Gen 4 windowed P-Mags. That was all I had on my last deployment was P-Mags. Are you saying reserve is or guard is for Air Force or all? Air Force-wide. Perfect. So That's everything fucking embarrassing. Is, Let's bring that up to the army. Every every P mag, every mag. So I don't know if, and it's you know, again, it's one of those things where the Air Force can't snap their fingers and have two point five million P mags overnight. So we're getting them phased into the units. But I know that the downrange unit I was at had all P mags. I don't know where my unit's at because the Verona we haven't been up there in a while. But I know they're scheduled to get them. So That's yeah, amazing. P mags for everyone. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. And like, and I would like to say I'm not just trying to trash the Army right now because, so funding goes in, in phases of five years mm. for the National Guard. You you decide, okay, I want $12,000 here, $120,000. Why is your finger here. so long? I think it just looks like that. Or you might have big old man hands on no, you. No, I Lana. don't. They're like, they're, see, like, even like, it's what, oh my God. Hey, cool. Now I can sell feet pics for this video. <laughs> Mighty. Have I showed you my toe thumbs yet, Caleb? No, I have not seen your okay, toe thumbs Okay, you'll have to yet. look when you get here. Um, <laughs> anyways, no, I'm I'm all like, I am all in. Uh, Somebody's going to slide into your DMs and be like, uh, send me feet pics. Oh my God, how many people do you have in purgatory on Facebook right now? Because I have like 600 people in purgatory. Purgatory is the 30 day snooze. Uh, Purgatory lot. is like they added you and you don't want to decline or accept because you don't really know. Oh, God. I don't know. Like 800? <laughs> Fuck. I, yeah. I have no yeah. idea. I thought you were talking um, about the 30 day snooze because I've been handing out maps you on do Facebook. That? Oh, I, I just fucking... delete them. So a lot, the, I kind of have this rule. So what I'll do is if you post something that's like outrage porn or bias porn or super cringy or whatever, your first offense I give you a 30 day snooze. Okay. Your second offense, I'm going to unfollow you. And like, if you, then after that, if you like make a comment or something on a thread of mine, uh, or something that's, you know, a strike three, then I'll just unfriend you. Cause I'm like, I ain't got time for that in my life. You and strike like, once and unfriend well, them. And so, because a lot of the times, because people are people and people have strong opinions and especially in these Corona times, people have emotional reactions to things and it's not fair for me to judge 
someone's emotional reaction to what has been a nationwide sort of traumatic moment, yeah. uh, it's not fair for me to judge their emotional reaction based on my circumstances, you know, That's because right. I'm the, my dad was a cop because I like all of my friends are cops or in the military because I'm in the military. I have a certain set of biases and a certain lens that I perceive the world through, you know, my white, liberal friend from New York does not have that same set of biases that he perceives the world through. And so just because he says something that I may not agree with or that may affect me emotionally doesn't mean he's a bad person. And yeah. I think that the let the, and I think that that sort of reaction where I'm like, Oh, well, fuck this guy, he's a dick doesn't actually help. I would no. much rather be like, Here's a 30 day cooling off period because it's not just for him, it's for me too. Because in 30 days, when his stuff pops back up, and if you know we're back to being normal, that means that when we talk, we talk to each other like people. And that, at least in my opinion, does way more to help the situation than hurt it. I would much rather have friends who disagree with me on topics and have different perspectives than just like have a circle of people where we all think the same stuff. You know, yeah. which is why I, you know, but also sometimes somebody may say something stupid, like I hate all cops. And I'm like, you know what? You're, you're getting a little nappy poo on Facebook. Just a little 30 day nap time. Just, and yeah. then, you know, we come back in 30 days. And if they say it again, then I'm going to be like, okay, this one's permanent. Yeah. Cause I mean, those people you can't even reach. You guys can't right. even, won't even be able to, um, what were we talking about? Oh, I have no idea. This podcast oh, five year is periods. You yeah. want something to change in the National Guard, you need to wait. And, like, that's where it really comes down to. It's like, I'm not saying that the Army's not doing anything to do, um, like, the right thing with these magazines and stuff, but funding goes in stages of five years. If you want your 120 grand right here, okay, that's great. You go through all this testing or whatever, and then you decide you need 50 more grand. It's going to take another five-year increment. It just takes a while. But, yes. uh, no, we are working towards it. Things in the government move very slowly. Yeah. And especially with this new uh, rifle call, like, coming out for the Army, slings are going to be paramount because you need uh, um, stability. That's the word I was looking for. Stability when shooting off a barricade. And so, like, your black felt slings, I get it, Marine Corps, you're, you're, you did great stuff with them. You learned, whatever. Do that old yeah. loop with, like, yeah. the, the cocked arm. And they're like, I'm like, what are you even doing over there? It's some crazy shit. It's great. Um, But... So it's going to be needed for that and learning it. And also just like doing patrols and stuff, seeing soldiers not have a sling that is actually fitted to them and having their gun like on their back or like really low down here and just like hanging around, around their knees and stuff like that. Yeah, it is so sad. And so, yeah, I brought my own and I was able with, um, even if it has the thing that people don't realize is if say you have like a QD sling, like with QD mounts on it at home, you can still bring it, take off the QD mount and then put it on your standard M4 sling swivels. Like just tie it on like a normal two point mm -hmm. um, without QD and then just run that. You'll still have the adjustability on it. And, um, but yeah, if just bring your own stuff, if you know what's in the arms room, but yeah. 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 I, I saw a lot of, I mean, I've seen a lot, again, we have a good sling, but a lot of people don't know how to adjust it so that it works yeah. for them. And so I saw a lot of M4s hanging out around kneecaps. My big pet peeve, drop leg holsters. So, oh, okay. Okay. So Wait, before, Force, can you send me the NSM for that sling? If you have it, uh, I'll or have to look it up. Yeah. It okay. uh, yeah. I'll send that to you when I get off uh, okay. line. Uh, so in the Air Force, our standard issue holster is the Safari Land SLS, right? Great holster, good retention, all of that stuff. They also issue it as standard on a drop leg. And let me tell you how many fucked up drop legs I have seen, like just, yeah. just hanging out around the kneecap. I'm like, how are you going to... How are you gonna get that gun out in a hurry <laughs> if it you gotta like bend over sideways <laughs> to get it? And again, it's a problem that a lot of people aren't like you. I don't like drop legs in general, but you can set one up correctly. But no yeah. one is. But if you're not taught, if you're just you know some 19 year old kid fresh out of tech school, and you get to your unit and they toss you this drop leg holster and like go stand at the gate for 16 hours, you don't know how to set that up. And your yeah. choice is to either ask someone for help, which you're probably not going to do because you're a 19 year old kid, or just sort of deal with it. So, yeah. yeah, 
Uh, I would love for us to get rid of the drop legs. We're not, but we are switching to the new Safari Land ALS once we all get M18s. So, oh, good. Okay, good. Yeah. I'm just, I, the th it's funny that you you bring up like drop leg for in Safari Land because I'm still dealing with people running fucking Serpas, you oh, know. Yeah. So it's just hard. <sighs> Lord save me from the Serpa. Legit. It's embarrassing. I saw, and, uh, yeah. I saw a lot of fucked up holsters when I was, uh, so army cats would transition the base we were at in the Middle East all the time. And man, I saw like a lot of warrant officers and officers with their M9s in just the most like, like crappy, like leather belt slide holsters <laughs> and like, yeah. Uh, I mean, you've seen the meme of the dude who wound his belt through the trigger guard of his hip died. Oh, like, how man. does somebody not say something about that, like, to that person? Like, I have a rule that I don't jack with other branches because yeah. I don't know what's going on in your chain of command and that yeah. sort of stuff. But I would have said something to that guy. Like, I would it's have been dangerous. Like, uh, it's a safety uh, thing. Uh, yeah. uh, where's your fucking holster, dude? Like, it would have just been that. I, and, that's... like, if they don't know, they don't know. Like, if somebody's never taught them, like, that sucks. But Okay, but at that point, like, yeah, how do you not, me. like... If you're getting issued a weapon, holy shit, and you do that, yeah. I, yeah, um, I, I don't even know how that happened. So I, I really hope uh, that somebody lost, like, I don't know, a, may, maybe not a stripe for that, but, like, maybe they just got put in a broom closet and beat up a little bit. That's fine. Like, I don't, I think that it doesn't, I think men are more men when they ask questions. It, I don't give a shit if you're a man that doesn't know how to shoot a gun. I don't care. As long as you freaking ask. Like, I think you're less of a man if you don't ask. Wait, are you like, saying that humility and awareness of your own limitations is a manly trait? Yeah. Hey, uh, listen to that, guys. Uh, <laughs> girls think that not being a cock bag is attractive. <laughs> News at 11. What a surprise. Oh man. All yeah. right. Well, this podcast has been a blast. We're at nine almost 90 minutes now. Oops. So, Steph, do you have any last words for the people out there? Um, go read that article I talked about it about the National Guard. I think it will help ease some uh some animosity towards the guard and what they're doing. It's and on since, Gat Daily. Thank you. I was about to be like, please give them the URL. It's gatdaily.com is the website that we both write for. Uh, Steph's article is, you got to scroll down a little bit for it, but it's definitely there. Or you can just search for Steph in the little search bar up at the top of the Gat Daily website. Uh, I do also write for Gat as well. I, uh, I don't have anything nearly as good as that National Guard article, but the same day that this podcast goes live on my channel, we're hoping to go live with a new review of the Taurus G3 Compact, which is a brand new gun from Taurus that looks a lot like their old gun, but is probably a little bit better fingers crossed. Uh, that is it for us this week, guys. If you like the podcast, please subscribe on YouTube and hit the notification button. Or if you're listening on iTunes or Spotify or any of the other podcasting apps, make sure to go ahead and leave us a nice little review that says how wonderful we are, of course. Uh, and if you're watching on Facebook, share this around with your friends. Hopefully they'll get a laugh out of it. And I have no idea what I'm going to go back and edit out of this. So like for sure, editing <laughs> out some bad words. But anyways, guys, thank you very much for listening. Steph, thank you very much for coming on. Yeah.